think one of the things about this panel that you know, Rome teaches there is credit for is uh, we really managed to find speakers who could articulate viewpoints that oftentimes are not heard. And as an example, the next speaker is, uh, is, a, is a gay imam, Ramzai Abdullah. Abdul, uh, he's a specialist in Sharia and chronic interpretation, and he's the moderator of Muslim gay men listserv serving thousands. Uh, and he's also a member of the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force uh, Religious Roundtable. Please welcome Imam Abdullah. Um, thank you, and I'd like to thank Dr. for uh, your wonderful presentation to lead off. And I think it really explains very clearly the milieu in which we're finding ourselves today. Um, I call my sort of short presentation here, um, Homosexuality with Islamic Theological Thought. Is it historical, meaning factual, or is it hysterical because of emotions? <laughs> so, I'd like to take a few minutes to just give you a quick um, background for myself that I came to accept Islam when I was studying at Beijing University almost 25 years ago. And there I ran into some Muslim Chinese who had been Muslim in their family tree for over 1,100 years. So what I had read prior about Islam, many of the things that they presented to me was very different than what I had gotten in terms of Wahhabism that come out of Saudi Arabia. And so knowing part of the historical culture there, that I, it really sort of twisted my thinking about Islam. So well, they invited me to go to the, the Cow Street Mosque there. And I went in, they did the khutbahs both in Chinese and in Arabic, and the Chinese made perfect sense to me. And that was my beginning along the path toward Islam. So now, having been um, Muslim for a little over 23 years now, I'm very happy that such an event happened. And so I may I'll move forward. In my discussion, we're going to talk a little bit about Quran and, and Sunnah. Sharia and the agency, or the political agency of government, and then myth, myth and culture. One of the things that is often asked by homosexuals themselves, Muslim homosexuals themselves, is that they don't find us. We're not in the Quran. Where are we? And I tell them it's very simple. Well, simple, and, and uh, part of it is that when you read the Quran, it says, Oh, you mankind. Oh, you believer. I'm not speaking to you stewardess and you garbage man and you doctor or things of this nature, but it speaks to you as believers. So if you are a believer, the Quran speaks to you and you are identified there. But more specifically, when you look at the Quran in Surah 2431, where this very a long as um, a long business to type of men in which women are able to do not have to veil before, it has very near the end of it it says, and men who have no desire for women. And then in 2460, it also states that women who have no need for men. It was very simple, very clear. Now, how do you justify this in terms of understanding the Quran? is a misstep, and it takes a lot of work to do this. But through the process of understanding, because the Quran itself says that it is a very simple lesson, a very simple story for you to read and to understand and apply it to yourself. Therefore, I call upon all individuals, no matter who, who are believers, that they need to read their Quran. They need to spend time to reflect upon it. And with that, you shall be given an understanding that's much, that's very clear. So, um, but generally what people do is when they do in terms of the homophobia in the Muslim community, they run very quickly to the hadith. And the hadith, which is, um, I use hadith in terms of a learning tool. It's a teaching tool. During a time of period, a period of time when many people were not educated, these types of stories, were the ways in which people learn how societies instill certain types of more, more mores as well as standards for the community. And through that process, they utilize these hadith in the same way. But it doesn't mean that these hadith were actually accurate to historical facts. And through the process of, of uh, scholarly uh, uh, review, we find that many hadith are not factual, but yet they still teach very important lessons for society. So they do have a benefit. But the benefit is that it helps us understand things, but not rules in which we need to follow, step, lockstep to follow behind so that we utilize them to hurt and harm people. Generally in the Hadith, it says that um, we relate to them, and many of them, they say they're related to the Prophet. These particular ones are daif, or weak, and they do not actually relate back to the, some of the Sahaba or actually to political people within the communities during the first 150 years of Islam. So, um, and many of these things say that they're destroyed, homosexuals are destroyers of the world. That when two men come together and have sex, then the foundations of Allah 
shaken. Boy, what's that thing? <laughs> or it says, kill them. If you see one doing one to the other, then kill them. Well, these are our expressions of things that are going, dealing with politics. If you don't like somebody, find a way to get rid of them. That's always been the political way. So we've seen that the hadith have been used both to help the community and also to help control the community as well. But what's more important is that I think we have to look at the characterizations of homosexuality within the Islamic framework of thinking. Frequently we refer to the Lut story, or the Lot story, in the, the Christian Bible. And in Lut, the story, I, I, when I talk to homosexuals in particular, I say, read the words literally. And when they do, I say, what does it say? Well, these were men who turned away from their mates or their wives and then practiced homosexuality. I said, okay, well, let's step a little bit away from that, but let's look at the different parts of it. And it did indicate that these were heterosexual men who, through the process of power and control, utilized homosexual acts to perpetuate rape. Just like heterosexual rape is perpetuated by heterosexual sexual acts. And there's a difference between the two. For when sexual acts are utilized, it depends upon the circumstances behind them. Heterosexual sexual acts, when performed under a nikah or a buddha, is allowed. But the same sexual acts done not in the marriage, then it becomes haram. Therefore, the issue then becomes how did the sexual act itself turn into a sexual orientation rather than sexual acts in the crime that was committed by it. So people have to learn to understand, to read the text, and sometimes literally, and it really becomes clear as to what it says. Of course, throughout the process, we have the, the discussions, the issue of reproduction comes up. Well, a lot of created men and women, men and women, so that they are paired and they are able to procreate. And I say, yes, it's very true, because if it was not, that was not the system, the methodology, we would not be here today. But that does not mean that every man and woman are destined to procreate. Why? There are men and women who are unable to procreate because of their physical bodies, due to either illness, body is unable to do so to, to carry a, uh, to term, and or because of injury, that people are unable to do so. So are you going to then restrict them from sexual pleasure because they're unable to procreate? It's an overextending the, the, the understanding in which they discuss. But again, when they talk about pairs, I've had many people speak to me and say, well, it's about the pairs. And I says male and female. I say, that's true. For If you're looking for a particular end, that's very true. However, when we look at pairs, how are people coming to the world as pairs? Look at twins. You come in as identical twins, male and female. Or you come in as paternal twins, male and female. And then when you get to multiple births, sometimes you have several sets of twins and a single. So the ways in which we come in pairs has to be looked at very differently on the physical level, but also as we come to understand sexual um, orientation and sexuality generally, we understand that the outside and the inside can also come in a pair that's not necessarily matched. So there's a way in which we have to look at pairs as being something that can be destroyed on one level, but very well connected in another and appropriate on a different level. Um, then, of course, as uh, the doctor expressed that in Iran and some of the other countries, they, they expect that people who are gay, in many instances, and I met some of them, who are very unhappy because they did have gender realignment. Because they be forced, because there was no other option. Do this or die. So this is one of the cases, if you've seen the movie of uh, Jan for Love, there are some of the people who are in there actually met them. And so I've known Pervez for a number from the beginning of the filming. So I met a number of these people and traveled to visit with them. And some of them are very sad today because of the choice that they had to make. So the homophobia within the Muslim community has forced people to make changes that they themselves would not, did not want for themselves. Now, well, let's get to the Sharia side of things. And um, my favorite legal scholars, um, Dr. Khaled Abdul al Fadid, who is really my hero, if you will. Um, I really enjoy him because the works that he's done, he really takes Islamic law and has you think it through. And as a lawyer, he really enlightens me in many, many different ways. Now, in one of his books, he called The Authority and Authoritarian, he expresses very clearly that when people look to the text, the Quran, and to the authentic sunnah of Prophet Muhammad, not the Athar of the Sahaba, but the actual proven um, sunnah of Prophet Muhammad, Muhammad that those are, are authorities in which people then utilize to 
organize their lives, and develop legal theories upon. But generally what happens when the text is read by a human mind, then we become the authoritarian based upon our own personal experiences. And then we have to filter through that. A lot of times people aren't able to filter their experiences and to look at the generalization or either the theme that may be behind it because they may be too close to the actual text and say, well, this is the way I read it, read it, this is the way that it is, but not necessarily so, because each of us could read it and come up with some reasonably different opinions, things that we agree with and things that we don't. So when it comes to the human t interpretation of divine law, it is an incomplete science, and that we have to be open that my experience as an African-American male here in the United States can be very different from another homosexual Muslim who comes from Southeast Asia, or comes from Europe, or comes from South America. Our experiences can then influence us, though we have similar uh, beliefs and similar understanding of how the world works, but because of our cultures and things of this nature, it will make a difference. So, when it comes down to the Sharia aspect of things, we look into the Quran and we see that there's nothing hadood in terms of the punishment for homosexuality. And so that, since there is no punishment prescribed, the fuqaha, or the, the legal scholars and the, the legalists within the times, they developed an idea that homosexuality and should be punished because it's like zina. But zina is a heterosexual punishment for having sex outside of one's marriage. So how does homosexuality relate to someone else who's breaking their marriage vows? There's no association. But because, like any metaphor, since it is like something else, then therefore it is that. There's an stretch and extrapolation in that aspect. However, when it comes down to when you look at the many legal cases throughout history, heterosexuals always have a loophole. How? The Quran says that let those certain types of people be for certain types of people. So, if this person has sex beforehand and they've and, and, and if, um, committed crime, then they can marry someone else in terms of someone who did the same thing, such so as sex before marriage. Then they have a legal loophole. But for homosexuality, there is no such loophole. There's no way, there's no wiggle room, if you will, for them to do things legally. Now, um, therefore, Sharia and the, the legal scholars have not provided an adequate resolution for homosexuality in terms of them being able to, people who fall in love with each other, for them to be able to develop a relationship that's received in the community and accepted as any heterosexual marriage is. Because it is the way in which people have been taught to say, no, we will not accept this. It's not something that is against it, because anyone who stands before a law and says, I make a commitment to this person, and that with the best of my ability, I will try to fulfill that commitment to this individual, then we've done so before a law. But the issue is that before other human beings, then you have to deal with the community standards and then deal with those particular issues that may be difficult for people then. Um, so public displays of homosexuality are frequently punished. Now, we go to the Middle Eastern countries, African countries, Far East, in most places, outside the, the West, if you will, North America and Europe, men walk arm in arm, hand in hand, just as women do. And the friendship that they develop. When I first went to the Far East, and, and friends of their heterosexual men would grab my arm, and I was a little shocked at first, but I came to understand it's a form of friendship. And I was welcomed into their homes, and their parents became my parents. And they taught me the things, but you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do this. They walk with me around the community and say, don't, don't charge him the corner's prices. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew I had made it in. And so it was wonderful to see that the people were able to accept me for who I was as a person, and not because of my sexual orientation or anything of this nature. So it was wonderful to know that as I became more involved in my Islam, that, that, that Islam helped me become well accepted, not only in the Far East, but also in the Middle East as well. Okay. Let me run real quickly, because I'm getting falling behind. Um, so what I want to say is that um, pretty much the issue that we have to deal with, and um, the two things I'd like to cover, is that social structures, in terms of when people use the idea that homosexuality um, destroys marriages, or causes people to get involved with marriages that they really don't want, then it causes one of two things. Either they wind up getting married, or sometimes having children that they do not want, and then living a, a loveless life, which later on in life does cause problems, sometimes with divorce and or physical attacks. Because I have talked to a number of men, from, uh, Muslim gay men, who have <coughs> struck out because they were frustrated with their lives that they were living. 
Uh, the next thing is that honor killings are part of the same process. That tribally, uh, particularly in Arab and sometimes in Pakistan uh, situations, honor killings are the result because the one says, I don't want to do so, and because it shames the family, the person is eliminated. Um, and then the final part is that the, in terms of the government, they use taxier punishments because there's nothing in the Quran that they can find. Now, um, the last thing I'd like to, to state on this is that we should look towards um, Allah's creation because within that context, there are symbols and signs for us to look for. And from that, we can read Quran and then reflect. So in articulating an LGBTQ Muslim voice, Muslim LGBTQ Muslims are believers because they believe in the five pillars. They have the right to believe because there's no compulsion in religion. Their personal association with the law means that everybody should have their ikra. You should have your moment where you wait for Allah to speak, and then from your chest you know you have had your moment. And from there you're always connected. Also, but as Muslims, we have to know that we do work towards justice and not just us. <laughs> and also, that's, I will have to say that the support of allies such as Amin Abu Dhu and Shah, uh, Scott Kugel and, and Dr. Um, El Fadil and some others who have not publicly made the statements in terms of uh, theses and things, but they put in their books and things that we need to expand our understanding and that LGBTQ Muslims are developing a voice so that we can articulate clearly who we are and where we're going and why we love the way we do. Thank you.